our speaker, who is uh, coming to speak to us about the feminist resistance to Islam. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you Huzam, Huzam Mahmoud. Can we give her a really big round of applause, please? for the introduction and uh, thank you all for coming to take part in this debate this evening about uh, a topic that I thought it might be interesting because usually when we speak about Islamism and the struggle against it or secularism it's um, mainly less about feminist resistance to it as well whereas in my opinion when it comes to religion um, uh, the first people who are badly affected by it are women, in my opinion. And that's why it's very important as women to, to basically resist religion and resist its uh, dictate over our, our lives and rights and choices in life, basically. Um, and I am sure that you have all read and heard and saw the news about the um, important struggle against ISIS, against uh, political Islamic forces um, in the Kurdish part, both in Iraq and in Syria, and how specifically women took up arms to make sure that they are fighting against such monstrous uh, dark forces, really, that the only agenda they had was to uh, invade one place to rape its women, to either take them as sex slaves, selling them in slave markets and so on, that they basically made sure it exists in Syria and elsewhere, as well as to behead those who don't convert to Islam, such as the Yazidi men that so many of them refused to convert to Islam and they were beheaded there. So this, uh, this has been on the news for, uh, for um, at least couple of years now and then a lot of people um, now are asking is this real Islam or why you know why we are seeing this now for example and how comes that people are resisting resisting it in an armed struggle there has been a lot of confusions I have been in meetings speaking uh, against Islamism and, uh, and praising the important struggle that the women Kurdish women are waging against um, ISIS, I have been labeled as Islamophobe. I have been basically opposed that, oh, you can't speak about ISIS, uh, Muslims will be offended by it. It's so interesting to hear this in, in England, for example, and I've spoken about that before as well, especially at universities in this country. In a couple of places, I had a lot of opposition from the room that it was very difficult to speak because they, to them, they didn't care about the miseries and the problems and the beheadings and the rapes and the sexual slavery that ISIS caused in that region. What was important to them is not, not to offend Muslims, as if all Muslims are ISIS. <laughs> so that is the irony here, in my opinion. They were not able to distinguish between ordinary people who are Muslims and between those who actually take Islam into a, a higher level, into a level whereby they can kill, they can rape, they can invade, they can just destroy entire regions uh, under the name of Islam, or basically to practice its Sharia law, which they did in Raqqa and parts of Syria that was under their control, and in parts of Iraq, which was under the ISIS control. However, ISIS is not only the only Islamic force that is practicing Sharia law, and doing this kind of act. Saudi Arabia is like that. Uh, Iran is very much very similar. They have been stoning women to death in public for, for many years for so-called zina, as they call it, adultery. Uh, Saudi Arabia is still beheading people every Friday in public, and let alone the burqa, and even women didn't even have ID cards or the right to drive. Very simple, basic rights that people had it, like at least in the few centuries ago, but in Saudi Arabia, it still didn't exist. So you have all these kind of countries who actually adopt Islam as the official religion of the state, as the official, like, they make Sharia law the, the, 
you know, the, either the only one source of legislation in the country or part of it, so they affect entire population. I mean, they, they, subject, them, they subject them into laws and regulation that were practiced 1,400 years ago and it's incompatible with today's world, basically. Like a man can have four wives in the same house, a 60, 70 year old man can marry a child at the age of nine and 10. Uh, for example, the woman cannot divorce if, but a man can j just say, uh, I divorced you three times and he is divorced without going back to anything. So the, the kind of this, basically these brutal laws have been in place in this region for a very long time. There might be people who ask, well, there has been some secularization in the region. For example, Iran under the Shah or Turkey under Ataturk or to some extent to now. But when you look at these countries, they imitated the West so badly in terms of creating nation states after the fall of Ottoman Empire. In Turkey, Ataturk subjected, you know, ethnic minorities such as Kurds and Armenians to, to genocides, and they still deny it. And then they, in order to look like Europe, imitation of nation states in, where, in Europe, they just basically had to educate some women, educate some men, and then straight away change some laws and make the republic look secular and a modern nation state, because that is how it has been in the part in the West as well, when modern nation states were in existence. So, but you could see under that, under Ataturk, people like Kurdish people didn't have the right to speak their language, they were denied basic rights, they were subjected to imprisonment, uh, torture, disappearances, uh, you know, lots of other abuses that they were subjected to, and they were discriminated against systematically in terms of education, employment, housing, and everything that you name it. Uh, however, this kind of so-called secularism, secular nation states in the, in the region, for me, they are very much under question. Even during Raza Shah as well, again, a lot of people in Iran were subjected to imprisonment, execution, the leftists, the trade unionists, uh, Kurdish people as well, and they hanged the uh, leader of the Kurdish uh, nationalist movement um, in the public, so they destroyed the first ever Kurdish move towards creating their own state in the 1940s. So you can tell these so-called secular states before in the Middle East, like Iran and Turkey, um, they have committed all kinds of genocides and crimes, and they were calling themselves secular, okay? And their secularism is very, it's really very funny in a way, because if, if you look into their constitution, they still bring Islamic Sharia. You know, they still bring parts of it, at least if not all of it. Coming to Iraq, when Iraq is, was created by a British lady, anyway, Ms. Bell, and uh, some other people in the 1920s, again after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, they created a kind of semi-failed nation state, in my opinion. They forced people, like Kurdish people, to live in, within this, the confine of this so-called borders of nation state. Again, at some point they were secular, you know, saying that they were secular, but at other points they were more kind of religious, more religious than other uh, countries as well. Again, the shadow of uh, Islamic Sharia law was always there, you know, and even during Saddam's regime, people <coughs> called him a secular dictator. To me, it's a joke, you know, he was never a secular, he was a dictator for sure, but he was really not secular as such. Towards the, you know, the last days, like during Iran-Iraq war, he was using all kinds of religious protests, basically, uh, to, to be in war with Iran. He wrote Quran with his own blood. Well, I'm not sure if it was blood, but at least that's what he was pre pretending to get this doctor and put something in, in his vein and to write the Quran with his own blood. Or he put Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag, and it's still there. Even after his collapse, it's still there. And he allowed honor killings to take place in Iraq under the name of uh, preserving family honor. So it was basically uh, all happening under his regime. Um, 
You know, I think when we speak about secularism, we really have to be very careful who we call secular. I don't think dictators can be secular as such. When you look into the history of secularism, to me, it's social movements. I mean, I have read few articles and chapters about the free thinkers in UK and how they were basically the women and the men, how they were fighting and how they were socially <coughs> questioning the existing norms and relations um, in society. So it was not a dictator coming and changing everything and suddenly you're not allowed, for example, to do this or to do that and that we are secular. Things don't happen like that. It's a process. Secularism and secularization, in my opinion, it's a process. It's not about one man coming with his whatever willpower and change everything forever. It doesn't work like that. And that's why we see Turkey today. They went back and they are teaching children creationism. For example, and if you go to Turkey, you, you see a, a big number of women wearing the veil or even burkas and so on and so forth. So Erdogan exists because he has probably popularity and some social, uh, you know, uh, um, acceptance because of his of his Islam, Islamic views. He's not there just out of the blue, in my opinion. So let us be very, you know, careful about who we really call a secular, who we can how we can look into these states in the Middle East and how much suffering and how much violence that they have caused to their own populations, basically. You know, Syria, for example, another country that they pretended to be secular, but it was a Ba'athist regime, identical with the Iraqi regime. Again, you know, killing and, and executing people. And women, yes, okay. When it comes to the participation of women in public life, jobs, employment, education, and so on, when you have a nation state, of course you want to have <coughs> like different sectors of jobs, administration, administrating the nation state, basically. You need a layer of educated people. It's not like before where you have tribes dealing with each other and selling stuff to each other. This is, this is why some people show pictures from 60s and 70s about, oh, this is what women were like in Iraq or Egypt or this, and now why they have failed. Well, they are the daughters of those women who were wearing short skirts in the 1970s. Ask yourself what happened. Those women who were in short skirts, they were in the service of the nation state that was very brutal that was not particularly secular in a process of social changes, but it was really kind of pushing the society and bringing a, a layer of educated men and women to serve the nation state and to fill the gaps and to basically um, run the administration. I'm not doubting every one of them. They were intellectuals and leftists and secularists. Of course, they were subjected to torture and disappearances. This is what was happening under Saddam's regime. If you were critical of the way he was operating, of course you would disappear, but the next day, that's if you didn't run or if you didn't leave the country. That's why thousands of people were killed, thousands of people were executed, even in public. So this is the kind of problems that calling dictators in the region as secular dictators, I find it very kind of wrong and that we should, I have been trying to kind of give that image. That's why <coughs> ISIS comes and pops up in, in a region like ours for two reasons. People just try to reduce ISIS into, as a symptom of Western intervention <coughs> or foreign policy mistakes of US and UK or the Western foreign policy or poverty or disenchantment of the young people in, in Europe or so on and so forth. Okay, that might be a reason, but that's not everything. That's not the whole truth. Because there is a potential for ISIS in the Middle East, in my opinion. Because the mentality, you know, the way the governments in the Middle East have been operating, the way that they never were actually allowing any leftist or secularist to operate and to kind of gain the momentum to, to secularize the society, uh, that's what we end up with. At the state level, we have, by laws and regulations, some kind of a uh, facade almost, that we are a secular nation, and we are a secular nation state, basically, which is actually, when you look into it, it's a failed nation state. It's not 
It has nothing to do with nation state as such, but also it has nothing to do with secularism itself as well. So this is why people are left to be influenced by brutal groups like ISIS who are mobilizing the people under the pretext of fighting the imperial powers or under the pretext, oh, you are being discriminated against or you are uh, in the margins of society in Europe and so on and so forth. And then let's join in and just destroy the whole region. Or to carry out suicide bombing in these countries or attacks on bars and uh, like for example happened something yesterday or to behead the priest or all kinds of activities that is going on terrorism worldwide is conducted by Islamic groups who are using pretexts of discrimination and poverty and so on uh, and their own alienation um, to use it as a pretext basically to recruit young people to brainwash them whereas actually the fact is that the aim is for them for those big heads um, behind this movement is that they want to uh, to them at least that's what they are dreaming of is to create Ummah, uh, the nation because to them nation states and borders are meaningless so to them nation Ummah, is what is has to happen in their under their influence that is to convert people around the world into Islam and if they are not converting then they can be beheaded, then they could be raped, then they could be this. So you can see they are trying to use all kinds of tools and means to basically, even if the activity is at a small level, they will still do it. To them, that's a kind of jihad. So jihad has a very widespread meaning to them. Carrying out an attack in front of that garden could be a jihad to them. So this is, uh, as I said, the topic is very broad. I'm just trying to make bullet points really here and there to try to connect the dots. Uh, I hope I am making good, but I'm happy like if people have questions, uh, I'm happy to elaborate more. So this is really why we have ISIS, we had Al-Qaeda. That's true, a USA or other European countries do use them against this or that <coughs> at some point for political differences, but that's not, as I said, the only story. Other stories are the ones I've spoken about as well. Uh, their own um, ambition to create the Ummah, their own ambition to basically carry out violence and destruction to them. This world doesn't mean anything. They can have 72 virgins in the other world. They can just rest forever and never work or never study. So that kind of lazy world and imagination that they have. So it's interesting how a lot of, there's a lot of imaginations and a lot of stories behind this particular terrorism that is Islamic terrorism in my opinion. It's nothing else but Islamic terrorism. People try to distinguish between what ISIS does with origins of Islam. They keep on telling us that Islam is religion of peace and Islam is religion of coexistence and that ISIS is not Islam. But actually, most of the things that ISIS does, they bring a verse from Quran to make sure people are convinced that what they are doing is compatible and it's actually uh, in line with what Quran is saying, for example. So uh, it's not me that I'm saying uh, ISIS isn't uh, compatible with Islam, but actually, when you look at them, and when you look at the history of Islam itself, from the times of uh, Muhammad until now, Whenever a political group adopts Islam, I mean, you can't you can't basically get better results. You know what I mean? Be it from the Islamic regime of Iran, Saudi Arabia, ISIS, Al Qaeda, Mujahideen in Afghanistan, lots of other places. So you can see there is a pattern. Uh, one thing that always comes to our mind is the plight of women and really young girls that is a very big part of their agenda is straight away they target women by failing by not allowing them to work or to go to universities or schools and so on by making fatwas of young girls nine year old ten year old to marry them like what isis was doing appealing to young girls to go and serve the fighters sexually so that they are satisfied and they can fight better and they have created all this kind of pornographic 
Islamic pornography, I call it, you know, about how um, they were recruiting young girls. And now you read stories and how messed up they are. There's a lot of children out of all this uh, mess that they have created and with young girls, some of them even from Europe who went there, some of them are even Europeans, uh, and others from the region who joined them, you know? So you really, the kind of violence that they use and the kind of appeals that they make, it's very disturbing and it's very inhumane. It, it's very difficult to think after centuries of struggle for women's rights, for human rights, for children's rights, we still have things like ISIS exist that are committing all kinds of crimes in front of our eyes, <clears throat> and yet so many people um, refuse to basically, uh, you know, align with, um, create alliances with the people that they are fighting them. People like us, like myself, like the Kurdish women, like secular uh, atheists, Iranians, Arabs, lots of other people, the grassroots I'm talking about. You know, not nation states like Turkey who have committed, who have subjected the entire people into, you know, genocides and, and pretending to be secular. That's not secular. It's, it's a disgrace to secularism to basically commit genocide and to still think that you are secular, you know. Uh, and where is the humane, where is humanism within that, you know. Uh, where is the values that comes with secularism. In my opinion, secularism is not about Turkey or some other countries um, out there. Um, coming back to the struggle against ISIS, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to see that Kurdish people, or specifically Kurdish women, are taking the fight so seriously against ISIS, even taking up arms that was rejected by so many feminists around the world, that women should be peaceful, <coughs> that women should not make war, and that should not take part in a fight or a war, but actually, with forces like ISIS, what choices you have? Do they come to negotiate with you? Do they come to talk to you? Their only agenda was to come and to kill Kurdish people because to them, Kurds are not Muslims. That's what they say. And to them, that Kurds have to be either diminished, killed, and their women to be taken as sex slaves and raped. And then they started with the Yazidi people who are Kurdish as well. So then they attacked parts of Kurdistan and then Iraq and then Syria, the entire region. So it's really difficult. How can you negotiate with that? How can you come to an agreement with, with these people who have come with an agenda of destroying you? I mean, being passive uh, in your own home until you are captured and until you are turned into a sex slave and raped repeatedly, this is not a choice. You know what I mean? Pacifism is good, but when? That's the question, that's when I always ask. You know, I, I think um, I'm against uh, nation states military, for example, women should not be part of nation states military because this is where big wars happen. But when it comes to revolutionary st struggles, as women, we have to question ourselves. This is a revolutionary struggle against ISIS to liberate our cities, to basically fight for women's rights. And this is what Kurdish women managed to take up arms not as part of a nationalistic struggle but as part of a liberationist struggle but at the same time fighting for gender equality and that's why as soon as they defeated ISIS they came up with one of the most progressive constitutions in the Middle East. They made sure child marriage is banned, they made sure polygamy is banned, they made sure uh, marriage can only take place between two people at, I think at the age of 18 or something, even without the consent of their parents. Uh, they made sure that in every committee, in every post, administrative, uh, legal, political, there is a woman and a man. So they made sure that the equality happens at all levels, not only uh, basically at the political level, for example. There has been a lot of great achievement within such short time. Because women were there in the struggle themselves. They were armed, and they were fighting, and they were resisting. And that's what made this struggle, in my opinion, so beautiful. We see historically that like in a lot of national liberationist movements in Eritrea, Algeria, lots of places where women took up arms as well. But then after the war was over and the enemy was defeated, women were sent back home. There was even no political post, no 
joint posts or anything like that, or uh, even in the constitutions, their rights were not enshrined. So, to me, this is a great step forward that we have to be supporting them and, and really, you know, to, to spread the word about this important struggle. As to us in UK as well, and I'm traveling all the time to raise awareness about these struggles, but also about us, our lives. Because I'm British at the moment, although I'm always a refugee and a nomad, I never feel like I belong to somewhere, and that's the problem. When you are once you are uprooted during to war, it's very difficult to feel settled anymore. Not here and not in Kurdistan. So I'm in the limo now. I think, you know, I come to UK as a refugee and I have been living here for 20 years. My daughter was born here, she's very British, uh, more British than I could imagine, <laughs> which is fine, of course. And I really think, when I, and I work with young people here, I work in college, my job is very different from my activism. And I work with young people, I work with everybody from all kinds of backgrounds, English, non-English, everyone, <coughs> British, uh, in a bigger picture. And I find it really difficult to see so much radicalization happening um, in this country, to see our younger generation who were born here, who, who were brought up here, who went to universities, to colleges, to schools, to basically become suicide bombers, to basically become radicalized, and they come to school with beards to hear, and the kind of symbols and signs on them that tells you from the beginning, it's an identity, and they just make it clear, they impose it on you, even in terms of appearance, which is really bad. I mean, you could be anything, but you don't need to impose it on anybody at workplace or when you go to school or university or anything like that. Plus, they could be gone anytime to join bloody terrorist groups like ISIS, or they could carry out any kinds of terrorism in this country or elsewhere and that's what <coughs> it makes me worried it makes me basically think all the time what we could do to embrace these young people or to basically um, uproot this problem of radicalization in these countries as well um, I myself, I have been trying to look for answers. I have been trying to. I really don't like it when I see young people who grow up in this country and they are wearing the veil and burqa and they are politicizing it. They turn it into an identity and they are defending it day and night on social media and even many newspapers in this country. Oh, it, veil is liberation, it's feminism and that. But to me, it's bullshit. Veil existed even before Islam comes. In this region, women, uh, because they were prostitution, of course, as usual, everywhere, and that women, like uh, of the upper class, were made to wear the veil, to, to distinguish between immoral women and the, the ones who have morals. So imagine youngsters coming and sticking to veil as a form of identity, as a form of feminism, Woman liberation makes me feel sick to death, you know? How, what kind of, if, if that piece of clothes was actually used in the ancient times to segregate moral woman from the immoral woman, and now you are taking it as a form of resistance, that is really where the problem is, in my opinion. We've been trying to explain that, of course, but the, the amount of brainwashing and radicalization is so strong that they don't even try to hear that um, this is what veil was used for, basically. And then when Islam comes, Islam adopts this. And then they try for women to be modest. They have to wear the, this garment, this basically veil, and, uh, to be separated from other women. So it continues, the pattern continues. Otherwise, it has existed even before in the Mesopotamia. It was called Mesopotamia before. Yeah, even FGM existed, female genital mutilation existed then in the Egyptian time before Islam comes. But when Islam comes, part of it will adopt FGM as well. Um, and that's why it existed 
you know, some people say it's culture, but the religion have a very big hand in that as well. So a lot of other things that really restrict women, and this religion itself put women under immense pressure that you are a female, you are half brain, you are fitna, which means like you are causing trouble all the time. Whatever happens, if a man is aroused, it's your fault. If a man rapes you, it's your fault. If whatever happens, basically you grow up with a lot of guilt. You, they, you know, the kind of social upbringing because of Islamic culture is that they, it puts women under a lot of pressure, makes you vulnerable, um, full of guilt and sin and so on and so forth. For me, when I left Islam, I felt such a relief. It was like a huge nightmare, you know, was there all the time. Uh, although I was not a good Muslim, basically, I never wore the veil or anything. It was just like looking after your mom. My mom was a devout Muslim, of course. But then I was always doubtful. I was always looking for answers. Why everything is a woman's fault? Why women are so, you know, inferior? Uh, comparing to men. Although my family were very secular and leftist, but because as a child you generally go after your friends and their mothers and your mother, things like that. But really it was a, such a big relief for me when I started questioning and when I started finally leaving Islam many, many years ago. And I felt like a completely different human being. I could use my own brain to think. You know, because they don't want you to, to be knowledgeable and to have access to knowledge and education so that you can't speak for yourself, you can't think for yourself, so that there is a holy thing <laughs> that only decides for you and, and um, decides on your life, on your sexuality, on your marriage and death and everything, basically. So women are treated so differently and in such an inferior position in their life and death, and, and that's what I really hate. And I think that's why it's important to have this very feminist resistance. That's why I call it a feminist resistance, to make it clear that it's us women who have to oppose Islam and all religions that try to come back and that try to dominate us and our way of life and um, liberation, basically. Of course, um, uh, you know, the fight should be on a society level, but it's more specifically to do with women in my opinion, as the first target of these religions, you know. So I'll stop here and uh, long live feminism. <laughs> <laughs>
killing you is a jihad. So this is a very dangerous discourse. This is a very dangerous approach to basically um, when you end up in this struggle for secularism, and especially if you are an atheist, if you speak out that you don't believe in God or religions and so on any longer, you basically is like inviting fatwas. <laughs> it's very difficult. So for feminists as well as secularists to support our struggle, to support this, to basically spread the word, we need financial support, we need moral support, we need understanding basically. For example, it's very difficult for us to go and speak in places. We are all working and outside our jobs we are doing activism. So imagine I have worked eight hours a day and then in the evening I'm going to another city and that city to speak to the public and to raise the awareness about the dangers of Islamism everywhere. I end up with several educated white girls and boys telling me like you are an Islamophobe. This makes the discussion very difficult. It's like, okay, you have Islamists who are threatening you, but you have Western intel intelligent young people who should believe in discussion and and reasoning mm. and criticism, they are telling you, no, you don't speak. Why do you speak? It's an offense to Muslims. We know what is an offense to Muslims and not, what not. You know, so many ordinary Muslims are against ISIS. So many of them, some of them are really scared to, to speak about it because not everybody is up for the risk. I mean, it's, it's a fact. So, you know, yeah, the, really the understanding, first of all, to listen to the debates and to to hear why we are fighting against this uh, Islamization of our society, why we are fighting against ISIS, why we are fighting against the ideology itself. It's not only the armed wing of Islam that we are fighting against, but it's the actual ideology of Islamization of society, the actual ideology of Islam that has been used throughout its history up to now to basically force the kind of lifestyle on entire societies that has a lot of resistance to it within. But unfortunately, a lot of people decide not to listen, not to support, but instead they say, oh, it's their culture, it has nothing to do with me, and I'm, you know, they should basically, they deserve it, basically. So the bottom line is that they deserve it, it's their culture, they come from there. That's not true. Look what is happening in America, in terms of the rise of Christianity again. Look what's happening about lots of religious fundamentalism everywhere, basically, Jewish and Hindu fundamentalism and so on. We really have to be very careful about the rise of fundamentalisms, extremisms as such, because if Islam rises its head and try to uh, occupy areas and to rule, like according to the Khalifa, according to uh, 1,400 years ago, Christianity can do that, Judaism can do that, Hinduism can do that again. So we really, it's, it's in my opinion, it's a, it's a fight of unity. Secularists and feminists should unite in terms of you know, defending universal values. The values that has to apply to everyone, wherever they are, in terms of protection of their rights and liberties and freedoms and individual choices. So this is what um, I think is missing. There's a lot of identity politics, Lisa. There's a lot of um, divisions and a lot of, oh, it's my rights, it's my culture, and you don't have to speak about my problem, or you can't, you can't understand my problem. It's like, well, okay, when we say Islam is doing this to women, is when we say if Christianity was in power, this is what will happen to women. It's not very, it's not a rocket science to understand that it's dangerous and then you have to be against it. So this is really the, the simple um, argument that we have to make. And, and I think one of the things that really kind of made me wonder, so many feminists in the West, uh, they just refuse to speak about religion anymore. They just keep silence and this silence makes you complicit with the rise of fundamentalism in my opinion. As women, we have to be the first who speaks out about against all religions, because we are all uh, women, wherever we are, we are the one more affected. So uh, be it here or anywhere else really, this is, this is the thing. In, we need to understand and to criticize, you know. Thank you. I think the lady is there. Can you finish your name? Um, Shira. Shira. I remember. Just talk.
for me because feminism helped me a lot to understand myself as a woman first of all and then okay I have been in different women organizations political parties and so on and so forth but we have created Kurdish culture project because we realized that in Kurdish society we have politics and religion as well as ideologies generally speaking uh, but they don't or the Kurdish culture generally speaking need to be criticized and has to be analyzed from a feminist perspective. So that's what Culture Project is doing, it, as well as paying attention and importance to art and literature and current affairs, politics, also uh, raising awareness about gender equality as well as feminism um, in a general sense, in terms of criticizing the media, criticizing the literature, and and basically the portrayal of women in Kurdish folklore, in music and art and so many things. And we have, I can, I'm happy to say that we have a good young generation who are very educated, very well aware of the dangers of stereotypes, of the dangers of not having a gender uh, perspective uh, in politics, in art, in literature, and generally speaking, cultural productions. So this is what Culture Project tried to do because we thought there was a gap, there was a vacuum, and that has to be, you know, feminism has to be everywhere. Um, also Kurdistan and Kurdish culture, I mean, really, um, in my opinion, there's no such thing as one particular culture. Kurdistan is very diverse in terms of uh, religions. There's not only one religion in Kurdistan. That's true that there's a big majority of Muslims, but there are Yazidis, there are Kakis, we have Jewish Kurds, uh, Christians, lots of different other, and lots of atheists and secularists and agnostics as well. Um, because historically speaking, um, Islam did not spread on a goodwill, and this is known, and they made a lot of crusades over the region and to so many places, even to some parts of Philippines and parts of China maybe, and Spain, and lots of places. So they were invading and occupying and forcing people to convert. So this is what happened to Kurdish people as well. I mean, we are forced converts. And one of the things that made me give up on Islam was like, I felt it's a religion not in my language and I don't understand it fully. And how comes? <laughs> For example, I speak to a god not in my own religion, not in my own language. For example, it was very peculiar, honestly. But that's one one of the things. But also, uh, another thing is that uh, there were other ancient religions like Zarathustrian, uh, Zarathustrianism, whereby a big a big number of people in that region practiced it before. But of course, Islam tried to eradicate that as well. Um, Kurdish people, like any other people in Mesopotamia, they were living there. They were there from maybe the beginning of time, like Persians and Turks and Arabs and whoever. Uh, but after, but you know, if, you know, it, there were no nation states before. Borders were not defined as such. People just lived and migrated and mixed and just exchanged goods. Basically, that's how they lived in the past. There were empires, little empires here and there, and fought against each other and occupied, and you know, all these kind of historical battles. But then Ottoman Empire ruled over that region for a few centuries. But then when they were defeated, when the Ottoman Empire defeated, then the region was, borders were defined, and redefined, and then Kurds were divided. So this is when, from, I mean, it's from the past 100 years, when all these failed nation states were created in the Middle East, and then Kurds were divided between four countries. And since then, there has been a huge, not only physical genocide, 
been genocide linguistically, culturally. Um, people in Syria and Turkey and Iran were not allowed to speak Kurdish even at home. Um, you know, in Iraqi Kurdistan, we had a more vicious battle with the regime whereby we managed to keep our language. We have a rich literature and poetry and so on. Um, so this is how this struggle is, is going on. When you look at each country in this region, they are all so diverse in terms of linguistic, cultural, and religious. But unfortunately, these dictatorships, they try to assimilate everybody in one language and one religion. And that is the misery. That's where the problems all began. That's why I always think the idea of nation state is very flawed. Even in Europe, when you look at it, I mean, look at England, or look at France, or look at it everywhere, you see people, you know, even people who were, you know, Spain and lots of countries, it's very difficult to name uh, one country, one nation, one border, one flag, one language, one religion. And that's where the problem begins with every failed nation state. So this is our story, basically, and we continue to struggle. And actually, generally speaking, Kurdish people have always been progressive in their outlook towards the world. They have always adopted leftist ideologies and secularism and so on. And, I mean, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan was the birthplace of the two uh, or three different generations of leftists, for example. I mean, they were Iraqi white, not only Kurdish white. They were born in Kurdistan, these political Sorry. Is there a sense of ethnic identity through a common language? Is there a Kurdish language? Of course there's a Kurdish language and, and it has and dialects. You, you as an Iraqi Kurd would understand and be able to talk to a, a Turkish Kurd. You know, because if you realize that we were divided and we were, it was like we were in excommunicado. Mm -hmm. You might not believe it. I met Kurds from uh, Turkey in Europe, not in my country because mixing together was very limited. Our borders were heavily guarded. Uh, you might not believe it, when Saddam's regime uh, was toppled for the first time, I saw map of Kurdistan. We were kept in um, dark from our history, from our geography, uh, even the language was before banned. So you can imagine a lot of things were forbidden and how can you basically, but I think it's a very important thing that we still exist and we continue to fight and we are the most progressive uh, force in the Middle East. I mean, it's not us, I mean, you can go there, you can compare, you can see. That's why men and women equally took up arms against ISIS. We don't want to be Islamized. We don't want to go back. 1,400 years ago. This is our battle, really. I mean, that's why, um, that's what makes a lot of nations, so-called nation states in the region, so angry about Kurdistan <laughs> and the Kurds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we um, all agree that fundamentalism is a problem, mm -hmm. but to what extent do you think um, moderate religion do you regard it as a way forward in helping to uh, perhaps talk to the fundamentalists? Or do you see it as a sort of slippery slope towards fundamentalism? The problem is that lots of people have moderate views. So what, how do you think we engage with them to solve the problem of, um, of fundamentalism? Well, that's a good question, and um, the problem is, um, I, not the problem, but probably the solution is, look who is talking about moderate Islam or moderate religion. Is it an ordinary person who is not in any political Islamic organization? Yeah, they can be modest. My mom was a modest. She was wearing the veil, but she was praying, but she was one of the best persons I've ever known. She would never harm anybody, she would never judge anybody, she would just do good. You know, that kind of Muslims, they are beautiful. You know, I had, and she knew I was, an, I was an atheist and I was a leftist. And to Islamists, I'm an infidel and I have to be killed because it's a jihad. But to my mom, I was 
her daughter and she had no problems with me. She just said, okay, when everybody dies, they go to their own graves. That was the best thing for her to say. You know, but the thing is, if you, when people make Islam, a way, like they turn it into organizations and political parties and schools and so on, sorry, there's nothing moderate about it because they want to bring it to public space, they want to give it more importance, they want to make it special, not to be criticized. Well, I know, I know that um, that's what the fundamentalists want. They don't want any kind of moderate Islam at all. But what do the people like your mother, who isn't, wasn't, isn't a fundamentalist, are they, are they shielding some religious ideals from criticism, unwittingly I mean, not, not through of forbidding course. talking about it, but simply by holding them, the numbers of people holding those beliefs makes it harder to criticise them, doesn't it? You know, of course it is difficult to, when somebody deeply believes in something, no matter if it's religion or ideology or whatever it is, they find it difficult to be criticised. I mean, I have lived this friend who wouldn't who wouldn't accept any criticism of their ideology. For example, if you say, oh, Lenin is a dictator, they wouldn't agree with you and they both would fight. For example, but I'm not saying that this is similar, it's very different, but what I'm saying, ideologies and religions are precious to people. You know, feminism is important to me. When I see people on social media, they bash feminism, I just want to grab them by the ear and just say, you know, what feminism did to you so that you are so pissed off. You know what I mean? It depends really uh, how we want to go about. That's why for me secularism is a good solution. You can be religion on a personal le religious on a personal level, but please do not bring it to public. Please do not open a special school for your religion. Be it anything, or please just don't meddle with the laws uh, and with the legislations and, and judiciary. So this is the kind of arguments that I think will protect all of us. Those who are religious, those who are not religious, those who are not sure what religions they have. So I think we are all human beings. We have a fear on this to be here, to be alive, and we have questions and we have things that we don't easily get answers for. Some people find you know, comfort in being religious and going to church or going to mosque. You can't deny them that right. I wouldn't go and argue with these people or that atheists would know. I would just it's fine, you know, but when people really dedicate their 24 hours to advocate for Islam and to spread propaganda and leaflet and this and make conferences and seminars about, like, this is when it becomes political, this is when there's nothing moderate about it, in my opinion. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Ismail, I am a prepared partner. I'm wondering about, you mentioned about the Islamophobia. And do you think that Islamophobia connected with the orientalism? Mm -hmm. Do you think there is anything, uh, is that related with the, with the orientalism or with the idea of the colonialism? He says, do you think Islamophobia is related to the idea of Orientalism or the colonialism? Uh, well, well, there's a problem, of course, and there is a connection, in my opinion, and as we've spoken about this in other seminars as well, like, the problem is some people in the West, especially those who work with think tanks and the more official kind of people, they always try to put you in boxes. It's easier for them. Oh, this is Muslim, this is backward, this is from that region, so they can only have Islam. They cannot think of you outside of that box. They cannot think and believe that you are not uh, easily boxed or ticked into a box. Because you can think, you can be atheist, you can be secularist, you can be a revolutionary, you can be a feminist, you can be atheist, you can be anything. So to them, it, there's a, it's a veil of racism, in my opinion. You know what I mean? That you cannot, because you are not white, you are not Western, and knowledge is knowledge and reason and secularism and Western values are Western. 
that way the East can never meet the West and that you cannot really, they cannot imagine that what they call a brown woman or a brown man can be really a thinker or a writer or basically a feminist or uh, somebody who just doesn't believe in any religions. And these are the people who have, they're not ignorant of our history uh, actually, but they just, it's easier to put you on the other side of the bridge and for them to be here because they don't want to deal with your problems. They don't want to deal with that problem of defending people or organizations or movements who are progressive, who are secular, who are leftist. Whereas the, I, the Orientalist idea is that you are either failed and need somebody to um, liberate you, and that someone is a white man like in America and the uh, wars on Afghanistan and Iraq whereby women were used as a pretext to, for example, attack Afghanistan. So this is that kind of picture that plays in some people's minds as well, in my opinion, which, has, which we are trying to break. Here. What's your name, please? Annie. 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 Um, you mentioned how um, distressing you find it when you see young women today wearing a hijab um, because of its association with kind of oppressive cultural practices. Um, but one thing we have seen in kind of other cultural practices which have been previously used to oppress people is. Um, uh, young people um, reclaiming those terms and reclaiming, for example, words that were used in a derogatory sense and mm -hmm. cultural icons which were used as forms of oppression. And I wonder, um, and, and that it, in then becoming a process of empowerment for the individual who was previously oppressed. I wonder if you think that um, it, is that a possibility for the hijab in, in contemporary life or, or do you consider that that's not an option in, you know, to kind of reclaim it and turn it and transform it into a parliament? I think this is the, uh, the problem with identity politics that earlier on I, I emphasized uh, a little bit on it is that uh, they stick to even whatever oppressive and misogynist and often bigoted ideas of what one can be. Uh, and turn it into some sort of so-called resisting the mainstream culture and specifically it's mainly happening in the West which is not in my opinion that's not a good resistance because it's like they are reinforcing uh, the most bigoted part of their own culture and they are reinforcing it and they are replaying it basically just to say we are against the mainstream culture or against the stereotypes and so on that's not really clever they have to invent something new. They have to go beyond West and East and Muslim and non-Muslim and, uh, you know, veil is my identity and this nonsense. Veil doesn't take you anywhere, okay? If you want to struggle against discrimination and organize against it, why don't you organize in the universities, on the streets, demonstrations, you know, write policy papers, uh, I don't know, protest against politicians and so on and so forth. Discrimination is against everybody in this country. You know, if you are a woman, even in this country, you don't have such a great deal. I mean, it's better than other countries as well. But, you know, we, we still have a long way to go. And I think also the mainstream movements need to be a little bit more open-minded in terms of discussing these questions. You know, my own daughter was born here. She has nothing to do with being Kurdish. You know, it's me, I'm the Kurdish part. I don't want to impose it on her. Imagine if she grew up and I never brought her up with double identities and <coughs> putting like lots of things into her mind. I just wanted her to grow up as her own in this society. Okay, so the thing is, if I see my daughter tomorrow, you know, having identity crisis or identity problems, it is difficult, you know, and I hope she never, for example, think bail is a liberation and so on and so forth. So far she's an atheist, which is good, but, yeah, you know. But the thing is, really, the young people, uh, we have to support them, we have to discuss with them, we have to include them in these movements, 
I mean, I have been speaking to so many young Kurdish girls and, and boys and university students, and they are amazing. I was at the meeting speaking at the university, and the people who supported me, they were the Kurdish students, and I didn't know they were even Kurdish, because you could not tell. You know, they are so, like, so British, their English, their accent, the way they talk, the way, like, they go to university and they find education so important. And they were defending me, and they found it so important to have somebody uh, who's a feminist and who's defending women's rights and who is an, an atheist and anti-Islamist. So this is the kind of things. I mean, why our Kurdish uh, students here, for example, the girls, they don't go out in Bayern and, and talking about Islam. So I think it's really important to... to I'm just saying, as I said earlier, and I'm just literally thinking and analyzing what we could do best because this is not a way forward. Going about and out in Vail of Vodka, what does that achieve? Hi, okay, thank you. See you next time. I must apologize. I was so anxious to get here early tonight. I rushed out of the house without a hearing aid. I must apologize that, you know, 50 years ago, people had microphones and loudspeakers, and they worked very well. But now we don't seem to have them. Microphones that work very well. Um, I must apologize on behalf of the British and French governments who, with the Sykes Pico Agreement, drew all these lines on the map of the Middle East and didn't recognize that the Kurdish people existed. I must apologize for the British RAF because when the Kurdish people in the north of Iraq wanted their independence, the RAF was bombing Suleimaniyah in Kurdistan and uh, put down the rebellion or the nationalist movement that way. I must apologize, Iraq was very quiet when I was working there for six months, but three days after I left, the <laughs> army officers killed the king and they killed Nouri Said, the prime minister, and things have gone down and down in Iraq ever since. Um, I must apologize. I'd like to go out and fight with the Kurdish people, but at my age I'd be a bit of a liability, I'm afraid. I'd like to congratulate the, uh, the soldiers of Kurdistan who have magnificently shone in the fights against some of the extremist movements. I'd like to congratulate the women soldiers of Kurdistan, who are very effective fighting units, which is rare throughout the world, well done to the women of northern Iraq. Thank you very much for coming. I've enjoyed every minute of it. If only I have heard everything, it would be better. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Mike is a former chair of private sector humanists. You can see why, can't you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now we're, we're, it's, it's getting very late. Perhaps we can have uh, one more question and then we can keep it fairly short because I'm conscious that people do have trains to catch and, and so on. So, my, yes, gentlemen at the back, yeah, what's I'm, your I'm, name, please? I'm Greg. 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 Yeah, you were talking about um, Kurdish women fighting against IS very bravely. I was interested in what, how that developed. Was that a government policy or did it spring up from as a kind of grassroots thing that which the government then seized upon? And there's sort of related to that, you also spoke just afterwards about the sort of constitutional changes. Have those actually been enacted as a result of women's involvement? Yes. Or is that or they're just proposals? Yes. Well, in terms of the fight, when uh, ISIS, uh, you know the uh, revolution, so-called revolution in Syria, or the Arab revolution, they call it Arab Spring, but sometimes I say Arab Spring onion because it made people more cry than <laughs> it brought joy, because fundamentalism was revived once again. You know, they were just in Tunisia or Egypt and so on. And in Syria, fundamentalism is just the sprung. Anyway, and then people started to revolt against Assad's regime. The Kurdish people, they took things into their own hands, liberated their cities from Assad's, and then suddenly ISIS comes up and try to invade the entire region. So there's a political party called Peda in, in Syrian, in the Rojava, we call it region. 
Western Kurdistan. And so they were mobilizing the people. But of course, it was more of a grassroots movement as well. Because people, even you see older women, like in their 60s and 70s, took up arms. They just, everybody in the neighborhoods, everywhere, those who could fight, they took up arms. This is what was the important about this important movement. And it become far more unified and it still continues. And now they are uh, battling for liberation of Raqqa as you might know and uh, the, the changes in the constitution because it's a very short time since the constitution is written and since the things are a little bit calmer i mean I, one thing i would like to talk about here the first case of so-called honor killing a man killed his wife and in syrian kurdistan in rojava now when there's a court hearing it's the people representatives of the councils as well as woman judge and a man judge and lawyers, it, there has to be female representation equally. So this was very important that for the first time, somebody who killed his wife, he was sentenced to life in prison. Whereas in so many countries in the region, they go free basically because they kill their wives. You know, even in this country, they get less sentence because it's a cultural thing. So, you know, these important changes are really, I mean, there was a documentary as well about like young girls and, and boys who, who marry, they just go to the registration office. They don't need religious ceremony or mullah to kind of bless their wedding and so on. As soon as long as they go to a registration office, that's it. That marriage is legitimate and the religious marriage is not. Whereas in UK we still have Sharia courts. We still have religious marriages in this country unreported and a lot of women are trapped in this kind of uh, cases. So it's a long battle, but it's a country still at conflict. It's still not a country, basically. It's still part of Syria and not knowing. We're not knowing what's going, how this will pan out. But they have created cantons. They have created a lot of representation, uh, local councils. You know, the structure that is going on there is very impressive. And it's really important, like in terms of what, there are a lot of local women's organizations and women's councils, they call Shura, whereby cases of family disputes and problems, if women have problems, they go there. There is uh, special lines for women to phone if they have problems and if they are under threat or anything like that. So in such a short time, I think they managed to do a lot of things that so many countries who have had nation states for 100 or 200 years in the region, they even couldn't reach there. So this is really a very important.